and welcome back to the Deep Dive. If you love unraveling the mysteries of the universe and exploring the frontiers of science, do us a favor and hit that like button and subscribe. Today we're going deep into the mind-blowing world of Sir Roger Penrose. A brilliant physicist, mathematician, and all-around big thinker. Yeah, he really pushes the boundaries of what we think we know about the universe and ourselves. Exactly. And we're going to try to break down some of his most complex and fascinating theories. Uh, in a way that hopefully... In a way that hopefully even your cat could understand. Right. Okay. Maybe not your cat, but you get the idea. We'll try our best. So one of Penrose's most famous theories is called ORCH or R. Which stands for orchestrated objective reduction. Quite a mouthful. It is quite a mouthful, what, right? What does it actually mean? Well, it proposes that consciousness, that thing that makes you you, isn't just the result of neurons firing in your brain. Penrose, along with anesthesiologist Stuart Hameroff, believes that consciousness arises from quantum computations happening inside these tiny structures within brain cells called microtubules. Hold on, quantum computations in our brains. Like, our brains are so tiny quantum computers. That's the basic idea. Yeah. Yeah, quantum mechanics, which normally governs the subatomic world, might be playing a role in your thoughts, feelings, and everything that makes up your conscious experience. This already sounds pretty mind-blowing, but why microtubules? What's so special about them? So think of microtubules as the scaffolding inside your brain cells. They have these unique hollow structures with channels inside that Penrose believes could act as miniature quantum computers. So how do these microtubules actually perform quantum computations? It gets a bit technical, but Penrose suggests that quantum hydrophobic channels within these microtubules, potentially organized in specific patterns like the Fibonacci sequence, act as topological qubits. And these qubits are the basic units of information in quantum computing. Fibonacci sequences like the spiral patterns you see in nature. I'm sensing a theme here. Right. It's fascinating how these patterns show up everywhere, from seashells to galaxies. And Penrose thinks they might play a crucial role in stabilizing these quantum computations within our brains. Okay, so our brains might be running on quantum code, organized using patterns found throughout the universe. Yeah. What does this all mean for how we understand consciousness? Well, it challenges the traditional view that consciousness is just a product of the brain's complexity instead. Orch or R suggests a much deeper connection between the human mind and the very fabric of the universe. So consciousness isn't just some random side effect of evolution. It's something fundamental to how the universe operates. Exactly. And this leads us to another one of Penrose's mind-blowing ideas, quantum entanglement. Are you familiar with that? Vaguely, it's that spooky action at a distance thing, right? That's the one. Imagine two particles linked in such a way that even if you separate them by vast distances, they still instantaneously influence each other. Wow. Penrose believes entanglement might play a key role in unifying and integrating different parts of the brain, potentially creating a single cohesive conscious experience. So instead of different parts of my brain working independently, they're all connected through this quantum web. That's one way to think about it. Yeah, it's like an invisible thread linking everything together, a kind of cosmic internet for consciousness. This is all incredibly fascinating, but also incredibly complex. How does Penrose even begin to explain something as subjective as consciousness using physics and math? Well, he acknowledges that there's a hard problem of consciousness that traditional physics can't fully explain. What's the hard problem? It's the challenge of explaining how those subjective experiences, like the feeling of pain or the redness of red, actually arise from physical processes. How do we go from neurons firing to the feeling of joy or the experience of seeing a beautiful sunset? So even Penrose, with all his genius, struggles to fully explain consciousness. He argues that conventional physics, even quantum mechanics, might not be enough. He suggests we might need new physics, something beyond our current understanding to truly crack the code of consciousness. This is where things start to get really intriguing. Mm. So where does Penrose go from here? This is where we start to dive into his ideas about consciousness being a fundamental aspect of reality, not just something limited to brains. He even suggests that consciousness might be woven into the very fabric of the universe itself. Hold on, are we saying rocks and trees have feelings now? It's not quite that simple. We'll need to delve into his idea of panpsychism next, which proposes that consciousness is a property of everything in the universe to a certain degree. But that's a story for the next part of our deep dive. It's fascinating how Penrose connects this idea of consciousness being fundamental to the universe with the Big Bang itself. Okay, now we're going from tiny microtubules to the origin of the entire universe. I'm strapped in. Tell me more. Right. He looks at the incredibly low entropy of the early universe, mm -hmm. which essentially means a high degree of order and structure. 
This suggests that something very specific and organized happened at the Big Bang, not just a random explosion of stuff. Wait, so the Big Bang wasn't just chaos, there was some kind of blueprint. That's what Penrose proposes. Yeah, he suggests that the incredibly smooth and uniform beginning of the universe, as we can see in the cosmic microwave background radiation, points to some kind of overarching principle or intelligence behind it. So he's saying the universe started with a bang, but a very organized and potentially conscious bang. My brain is doing backflips trying to picture this. I know it's mind boggling, but that's Penrose for you. He isn't afraid to challenge conventional thinking and explore these really profound ideas. So how does this all tie back to consciousness? Are we saying the universe itself is conscious in some way? That's where things get really interesting. Penrose proposes that consciousness might be woven into the fabric of reality from the very beginning. It's not that the universe is thinking like a human, but rather that consciousness is a fundamental aspect of reality, like space and time. Okay, now we're getting into some serious metaphysical territory. So if consciousness is woven into the universe, how does that affect us here on Earth? Are we all connected to this universal consciousness in some way? That's a big question, and one that Penrose doesn't necessarily answer definitively, but his work certainly opens up the possibility that we're more interconnected than we might realize. This raises an important question for me. You mentioned earlier that Penrose believes conventional physics can't fully explain consciousness. Does that mean he believes in something beyond science, like a spiritual realm or a higher power? That's a tricky one. Penrose doesn't explicitly endorse any specific religious or spiritual beliefs. However, his work does point to the limitations of our current scientific understanding. He suggests that there may be aspects of reality that science as we currently know it simply cannot grasp. So there could be a whole realm of existence beyond what we can measure or quantify with our current scientific tools that's both exciting and a little scary to think about. It is, but I think that's part of the appeal of Penrose's work. He pushes us to consider possibilities that might seem outlandish at first, but could ultimately lead us to a deeper understanding of ourselves and the universe. It certainly is a fascinating journey. We've gone from quantum computers in our brains to a potentially conscious universe orchestrated from the Big Bang. Where do we go from here? Well, we can't talk about Penrose without discussing his radical ideas about time. Oh, yes. I remember reading something about him challenging our conventional view of time as a linear progression. What exactly does he propose? He suggests that our everyday experience of time with its clear past, present, and future might be a kind of simplification. He argues that time could behave very differently at a deeper, more fundamental level. So is he saying time is an illusion? And not exactly. He believes our perception of time might be an emergent phenomenon arising from more fundamental processes. Imagine it like this. Our experience of time is like seeing a movie. It appears smooth and continuous, but underneath it's a series of individual frames projected rapidly. So you're saying time could be like a series of snapshots rather than a continuous flow. That's a good way to visualize it, and Penrose suggests these snapshots might be connected to quantum events, specifically the collapse of the wave function. Okay, remind me, what is wave function collapse again? It's a central concept in quantum mechanics. It describes how a quantum system, like an electron, can exist in multiple states simultaneously until it's measured. The act of measurement forces the system to choose one definite state, causing the wave function to collapse. Right, that whole weird quantum fuzziness that disappears when we look at it. So how does this relate to time? Penmers proposes that each collapse of the wave function could be a moment in time. So instead of time flowing smoothly, it might be a series of discrete moments, each one corresponding to a quantum event. So time is like a series of quantum clicks. My brain is working over time here. It is a challenging concept to grasp, but I find it incredibly fascinating, and it gets even more mind-bending when you consider how Penrose connects this to free will. Okay, bring on the mind-bending. How does he connect time and quantum mechanics to something like free will? He argues that the inherent randomness of quantum events, that same randomness that governs wave function collapse, could provide the basis for genuine free will. So our choices aren't just predetermined by our brain chemistry or our past experiences. There's a quantum element of chance involved. Exactly. Penner suggests that our decisions might not be entirely determined by the laws of classical physics. There's this element of quantum indeterminacy that could give rise to genuine freedom of choice. So you're telling me that every decision I make, every path I choose, could be influenced by these tiny, unpredictable quantum events happening inside my brain that's both empowering and terrifying. It is, and it leads us to another fascinating aspect of Penrose's work. 
his ideas about the nature of time and its relationship to consciousness. Oh, there's more. I thought we covered the mind-blowing stuff already. We've only just scratched the surface, but we'll have to save that for the final part of our deep dive. Welcome back, everyone. So far, we've journeyed from the microscopic world of microtubules to the vast expanse of the universe, all guided by Roger Penrose's extraordinary ideas. And we've seen how he weaves together physics, mathematics, and even philosophy to challenge our understanding of reality and ourselves. It's exactly. Now, you mentioned earlier that Penrose has some intriguing ideas about time and how it might not be as straightforward as we think. He does. You see, we tend to think of time as this linear flow, always moving from the past to the future. But Penrose suggests that our everyday experience of time might be a simplification and emergent property arising from deeper processes. So time isn't really an arrow pointing in one direction. Think of it more like a river on the surface. It seems to flow smoothly and continuously, but beneath the surface, there are currents and eddies, hidden complexities that shape its overall movement. Okay, I'm starting to get the picture. So yeah. what are these hidden complexities when it comes to time? Well, Penrose connects his ideas about time to quantum mechanics and those discrete moments we were talking about earlier, those quantum clicks linked to wave function collapse. Right, the idea that time might not be smooth and continuous, but rather a series of individual moments. Exactly, and Penrose suggests that these moments might not be evenly spaced. Time could speed up or slow down depending on the gravitational field and the complexity of the system involved. So time is flexible, almost like a bendable ruler. I'm trying to wrap my head around this. It's a radical concept, but it makes sense when you consider Einstein's theory of relativity. We know that gravity can warp time. Penrose takes this idea a step further, suggesting that quantum events might also influence the flow of time. So we're not just talking about time being relative to your speed or your proximity to a massive object. We're talking about time being influenced by these tiny, unpredictable quantum events happening all around us. Precisely, and this leads to some truly mind-bending possibilities. Imagine, for example, that near a black hole where gravity is incredibly strong, time might flow at a completely different rate than it does here on Earth. So if I were to travel near a black hole and come back, I might find that everyone I know has aged decades while I've only aged a few years, like in the movie Interstellar. That's the basic idea. Of course, traveling near a black hole presents its own set of challenges, but it illustrates how gravity can warp time in dramatic ways. This is all incredibly fascinating, but where does consciousness fit into all of this? Penrose argues that our experience of time, our sense of a flowing present moment, might be intimately connected to consciousness itself. He suggests that the act of conscious observation, that moment when we become aware of something, might be tied to these quantum clicks of time. So every time we become aware of something, every time we experience a thought or a feeling, it's like a tiny quantum event is shaping the flow of time for us. That's one way to think about it. It's almost like our consciousness is riding the waves of these quantum events, creating our subjective experience of time. This is so profound. So what does all this mean for us if Penrose is right? Does it change how we should live our lives? Should we be more mindful of these quantum clicks? It's hard to give practical advice based on such complex and theoretical ideas, but I think Penrose's work encourages us to view the universe and ourselves with a sense of awe and wonder. It reminds us that reality is far more mysterious and interconnected than we often realize. It's almost like he's giving us a new lens through which to view the cosmos, a lens that reveals a universe full of hidden connections and strange, beautiful possibilities. Exactly, and I think that's a valuable perspective to hold, even if we don't fully grasp all the intricacies of Penrose's theories. Well, on that note, I think we've reached the end of our deep dive into the mind-blowing world of Roger Penrose. We've explored his ideas about consciousness, the universe, and the nature of time itself. It's been a wild ride, hasn't it? Absolutely. And while we may not have all the answers, Penrose's work certainly inspires us to keep asking the big questions and to never stop exploring the mysteries of the universe. If you enjoyed this journey with us, be sure to like and subscribe to The Deep Dive for more mind-expanding explorations. Until next time, keep wondering, keep questioning, and keep looking up at the stars.